Christians who have a bad days, who have bad days. Is that what it says here? A message for Christians who have bad days, not day, but bad days. That's what it says in my notes here. Lord, you're going to talk to us about growing up tonight. You're going to talk to us about some adult things as children. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you have your mind made known to us. Lord, I don't have anything of myself to bring. I bring just your mind. I pray, Holy Spirit, you touch me and anoint me. Oh, God, prepare our ears to hear. Open our eyes and give us hearts to understand. Because without the Holy Spirit, we can't understand a word that I say, and I can't understand a word I preach. Wholly dependent upon you. Absolutely wholly dependent on you. So we turn it all into your hands. Lord, give me the strength. Give me your anointing. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, normal Christianity is not a matter of clear sailing. Have you heard that? Have you learned that yet? That no matter how holy you may be, no matter how many, how righteous you may be, you're going to have some bad days. In fact, the holier you are, sometimes the more excruciating those days are. Very painful. I want you to know I don't serve a good time God. That's only with me when things are going well and when I'm in a bad situation. He doesn't sneak off and say, well, when you work it out, I'll be back. He never leaves. He never forsakes. Paul said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Now, that Greek word there for earthen is frail clay. We have this treasure in frail clay. Now, frail clay the treasure here, by the way, is the knowledge and the presence of Jesus Christ. We have this great knowledge, this great presence of Jesus Christ in a frail vessel, and that means weak, easily broken, and easily tempted. Easily broken vessels. Now, we all suffer what the Bible calls infirmities. In fact, Paul mentioned Timothy's uh, often infirmities. Timothy was often sick. He is physically sick. And there are many, many Christians who whose bad days have to do with their frailty. They're, they have a very frail constitution. They're sick. Some of you listening to me right now, you wake up in the morning and the pain is there. Some of you live with pain. Some of you have, have never known a day for months, maybe years, without pain. And there are many, many Christians who, who go through terrible days of suffering. It's a time of infirmity. <clears throat> We're not speaking about that. There, there, are, there are other infirmities that are just as difficult, and perhaps more difficult to handle, and those are infirmities of the mind. I'm not talking about mental uh, illness. I'm talking about uh, those things that grip our mind. You, you can go to bed at night feeling happy. You go to bed, all is well with you, and wake up in the morning, and there's a cloud of the blahs hanging over you. You don't know where they came from. You don't know what it is, but there's just a cloud of, of gloom hanging over you. You try to figure it out. You don't know what it is. Others of you live with guilt. You can't shake it. It goes back somewhere. I don't know how long. Uh, it could be a result of sin that's still in your life. And if there's sin, God will let the guilt hang in until you deal with it through the power of the Holy Ghost. It's a wonderful gift of God when there is guilt because of sin. Some of you have condemnation. Others have feelings of rejection you've never been able to live with. You, you get up someday and somebody said something the day before, or you heard something, or you feel something, and we say we don't live by feelings, but we live in feelings. We have feelings, and they're going to affect your outlook on life. It's the way you respond. Now, I don't know what your bad, I don't know what causes your bad days when you wake up and you just have a, I'm not talking about a bad hair day. <laughs> it's a, you, you, you just have to at the end, I have had a bad day. 
This, this has been an awful day. This has been terrible. Some of you have to, to, to uh, stop maybe and think about it. You, I hope you're having this Mother's Day. I hope you're having a good day. For, for many, this is a very difficult day. Mother's Day is a hard day, one of the hardest days in the year. Because either your mother is gone, uh, maybe she died uh, not being a Christian. It could be so many, many things. Uh, some of you that are on drugs or come out of drug life or alcoholism, and you don't remember a good day with your parents at all, or your mother especially, and it's a hard day. Uh, for others, it's Christmas because they have no family. I don't. I can't describe what it is. Let me tell you what a bad day is for me. For example, I don't. I've often wondered if other ministers, especially, have the kind of day that I have. My my bad days happen in my study, alone with my Bible and with my God. Those those sometimes are. are I have to tell you, are my most difficult times. When I open this book, and I feel so ignorant, I feel so in, in, incapable of comprehending and digging out the truth, I read the stories and the messages of men that lived 300 years ago. Some of my favorite authors are the Puritans and John Owens and Sibs and Manton and all these men, and I read, th these were men who were not supposed to have been in an enlightened age. And knowledge is supposed to be on the increase. And here I am in, in my mid-60s, and, and I'm reading men that were in their 40s, and they are speaking things that I've never seen or heard. And my bad day is going into this and spending three and four days just reading and saying, Lord, I don't even remember half the stuff you teach me. I can't even remember. I've got a sieve for a mind. I have to sit some time and plead with God and the Holy Ghost for hours and hours to get a word to bring to you. And, and, and I don't know how many others of you feel this way or have ever gone through that. It's a very, very difficult thing to, to, to spend maybe four or five hours in this book. And I'm saying, Lord, I'm not, I'm not hearing it. I want to hear it. And there's a sense that you're, you're before this great, reservoir, and there's so much out there, you can't reach it. You can't comprehend it. You, you, you know that there's such an ocean of truth. I, I have stood, uh, I looked out my window, and I said, Lord, I don't care what anybody else has. They can have, they can have every piece of furniture. They can have my car. They can have everything I possess if you just give me truth. Just let me understand, let me see, let me know you. There's something so far out there and we have known and touched so little of it. And you can't enjoy God any further than your faith. And you say, God, I, I thought I believed, I've tried and I love your word. I'm not living in sin, but I'm so blind, I'm so ignorant. You say, well, Brother Wilson, you stand here and preach every Sunday. Yes, and I tell you, I go to the salt mine, and I dig. I, I, I heard a preacher one day, he said, he was talking to another preacher, boy, I've got three sermons today, come so easy for me. It just flows. I said, oh, Lord. Of course, I heard him preach, and I wasn't discouraged anymore. You see, that for me, that, that that's I have to say, Lord, first I pray, Lord, Holy Ghost, is there anything standing between you and me? I want it clear. I don't want anything. And I'll tell you, folks, that's the way you ought to pray. If there's anything there, take it to the Holy Ghost. And if there, he'll show you. If not, just start praising the Lord. Don't try to invent something. But you see, the only answer I get from God is that this treasure is in an earthen vessel and that the glory may be to God and he keeps us uh, humble. This is one of the ways, this is probably my thorn in the flesh, one way to keep me humble. Folks, you may think that as a pastor of this church that I stand here and I, I, I know so much about God and it's so easy to stand and give you a message. No! 
I tell you honestly, I, I have a hard time memorizing the minor prophets and where they are. Oh, come on now. I, where's Haggai? I, I, I have memorized, memorized, I can't memorize verses. I have a bad memory. And to me, that's a bad day. That's a difficult, difficult day. For a young man who called me last week, he, he, he had the worst day of his life. God, the young man, broken, tearfully said, I don't know what to do. A thought hit me today and I, I can't shake it. There's no God. I don't know where the thought came from, but I'm shocked and I'm hurt. I don't want to leave like this. I don't want to hurt like this. I had this fight, this thing in my mind, a thought, I can't shake it. There's no God. I was weeping. He said, where'd it come from? I, I, I assured him, said, son, just, just be still. Don't worry about this. Because this is the, this is, this goes back to the beginning of time. It's the devil's number one trick with young people, especially. He'll come to you, my 19 year old son, uh, or, or he was 18 at the time, Gary came in years ago when he was just a teenager. I'll never forget it. I'd, I'd seen he was having a rough time and I'd go into his room and he's crying and I said, what is it? And he's laying down and he said, I won't hurt you, Dad, but I don't believe there's a God. Now this boy was called to preach and I, and I, and I tell you, it broke my heart. At that time I didn't have the spiritual uh, insight that I believe God has given to me. Now, of course, Gary wrote it out because I said, you're going to stand still, Gary. You're not going to argue with the devil. You're not going to try to reason with him because you can't believe that there is a God through human reasoning. It's a work of faith only. You can't reason God into existence. And you can't persuade your mind that there's a God through reason. You can't get somebody's book about creation or anything else. That's not going to persuade you. I said, you're going to ride out the storm and just trust Jesus the best you know how. You're going to ride it out. This is a trick. This has been instilled in your mind by the devil himself. Don't argue with the devil. Don't try to do anything but stand still until the storm passes. If you don't move and you just stand and say, God... I'm having a problem trying to figure this out, but I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to come and hold me still. I saw God hold my son still. And of course, he's pastoring today on fire for God. And as I just told this young man to stand still, he said, Pastor, I'm going to do just that. I'm going to stand still. I saw him this afternoon, and he's on fire. The, thought, the crisis is past. His bad day is gone. Folks, these bad days often happen because the devil implants thoughts in our minds. He, he can come and plant a thought uh, uh, in your mind that God is not faithful, that God does not answer your prayer, and he can tell you how many days and weeks and months and years you prayed about something and seen nothing happen. And he'll come at you and bombard your mind with lies about God, about his faithfulness, about his ability or willingness to answer prayer. You don't fight that. You don't reason by it. You stand still and see the salvation of the Lord and get into this book and get your faith out of this book and look at God's history of faithfulness to the children of Israel and to all of our fathers who have gone by as we heard so ably this morning. Hallelujah. I got a letter this past week from an Assembly of God pastor's wife. Her husband died four years ago. She had, I think, four or five children. They're all grown now, married well. And she said, Brother Dave, my husband was a powerful preacher. He loved his family. He was, a, he, 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 he was faithful to his children. And he had a heart for people. He had a problem. He said, she said he had an adulterous spirit. He was an adulterer. He said, we had to, he had to resign four churches. One affair after another with women in the churches. And she said, I can't tell you how many times I was advised to leave him. 
But she said, Pastor Dave, I have been in the Word and on my face for many, many years. I have been a seeker after God. And I know how God hates divorce. And I, I just decided to hold on. She said, Brother Wilkes, I have had bad years. She said, I can only remember a few years in all those years. He died at 62, so they were married probably some 40 years, and, and uh, the children are grown. And she said, I can't tell you how many times I wanted to quit. I said, there's no use to this. This man gets up and preaches like a house on fire. This man moves the hearts of people, but he's an adulterer. She said, I hope he died in grace. She didn't even know whether the man died right. But she said, I've got to testify, Brother Dave. She said, all my children, because I had a promise the whole time, every time I thought I should give in, every time people would tell me that, that I was foolish to stay with this man and take all of this hurt and all this abuse, she said, God made me a promise that if I would just hold on and seek his face, he would honor me in the end. She said, brother, I've got to tell you, God has honored me. All four of my children are married to Christians. All have good jobs. I've got grandchildren who love me. She said, I am honored and revered in my church. I'm called everywhere to speak to women's groups, to young wives who are abandoning their husbands at the slightest provocation. And she said, God has honored me. It wasn't a bad day. It was a bad life. But God, she said, I, I want to, toward the end of her statement, she said, I am so blessed. I'm so blessed. I am so fulfilled. And she closes, she said, Christ is proven all sufficient for my life. The saintly Paul had bad days, days of testing, and one of them took place in Macedonia. He said, in Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, and within were fears. He didn't say fear, fears. Mark that down. Inside of me, Paul said. No, Paul was not a superman. Paul hurt. You can't tell me this man didn't hurt when churches he founded wouldn't even talk to him and gossip about him and turn against him and tell everyone in Asia he said was against him. These are all churches he founded. Gave his life blood, he said, the more I love, the less I be loved. This man hurt. This man had awful days. But he said, I am filled with comfort. I'm exceeding joyful in all my tribulation because God comforteth those that are cast down. What is God going to do to you when you have these awful days where doubts and fears you may even be saying things that you never thought you could say in your heart or think things about God. What does God, your Heavenly Father, do? Does He spank you? Does He chasten you? Does He judge you because you're having these kind of trials and you're going through these most difficult times? Paul the Apostle said, He comforted, He comforteth those that are cast down. Hallelujah. Are you sitting in this meeting tonight really cast down? You're going through something in your life. You're having a, a, a bad day or a series of days, just a bad season in your life. The scripture said, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth all who uh, comfort us in all our tribulations. Now, I looked at the the, the Greek word there, he comforts all of his children in their infirmities and in their tribulation. He comforts. He doesn't come to accuse. He doesn't come to whip you. He doesn't come to abuse you. He comes to comfort you. And the word comfort used there means to draw close, to call one close. It's an amazing thing about our Heavenly Father when you're going through this and feeling very unspiritual and very immature in Christ. 
thinking to yourself, I should have learned enough. I have heard so many messages. I have been so many years walking with God. I should have passed this point. But when you come to that point of discouragement and, and you're saying to, especially if you've been a teacher or a preacher of the gospel, and these times come, the Lord says, those are the times I call you closer to myself. Now, I'm going to tell you, in all honesty, I look back over my life, and I tell you from the depths of my heart, the only times I have grown in the Lord have been in my difficult times. I don't grow in times, not to my knowledge. There's the natural growth of those who have the increase of the growth of the Holy Spirit that is natural. There's always that increase. But it's that which I'm conscious of only comes when I've, I've been in some very difficult times and I've had to be totally dependent on the Lord and I know that there's no way I can do it myself. I've had to learn to trust Him. God will put us in situations where there is nothing else to do but trust. Or to throw it all overboard, overboard and harden your heart. Glory to Jesus. So, although we have bad days, and they're going to be inevitable for especially those who are new in the Lord, listen to me please, they should become less and less frequent as the knowledge of who you are in Christ increases. There should be fewer of these days and they should be less intense. And there should come a time when when the enemy comes in for an hour or two, that you have the resources to deal with it. Now, I told you before that when, when you're going through a hard time, the, God comes in by His Spirit, immediately He rushes in to comfort. If you allow Him, He's always there to comfort you because you're His child and He cares about you. Now, we, we, you, 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 it may be because of frail health, Doubt, fear, despair, depression, it keeps coming more frequently. And I'm telling you, folks, listen closely. If, if these things are happening to you more frequently, you're having more and more of these days that you can't seem to shake it off. And the depression keeps coming on. And the guilt and the fear hangs on. You're in need of some real spiritual help. Because this, if you allow it to continue, can turn to a hardness of heart. And I want to show you some of the scripture that will help you tonight, and I hope it will bring victory to you. Paul makes it very clear that it's possible to come out of childish bondage. Now, many of these bad days that we get are a result of our reaction to situations in our life and reacting childishly. Now, a child pouts. A child has short interest spans. A child can be laughing one minute and screaming the next. And this is what we often do when we're going through a trial. We, we are very childish in our reaction, and those childish reactions result in depression and guilt and fear and all these other things. In spite of our tantrums, I, I've had four children, got 11 grandchildren, and I've seen enough tantrums in my life. I've seen a lot of childish stuff, but never in any tantrum, never in any pouting session, no matter what my children went through, I never stopped loving them. I never wrote them off. I never disowned them. And sometimes we go through difficult times and we pout and we put on a, on a, on a fleshly tantrum. Oh God, that's the way you want to act. Why should I pray? I'll read this Bible and I go through it and, you know, we, we put on these little petty tantrums. God, how, how long? How long do I have to pray before you end? I don't see a sign of anything. God, you're not doing anything. That was the tantrum Moses put on. I haven't seen you call me. I haven't seen you do anything. God said, wait till tomorrow. You'll see what I'm going to do. Now listen, even though 
We know that our Heavenly Father loves us through every childish response. He has something better for us. He has absolutely something better for us. His great desire for us is that we lay hold of the knowledge of who we are in Christ and what He has provided for us. Some of you really have not yet come in to the place where you will lay hold of your inheritance. I want you to go with me to Galatians 4 and nail it down. Galatians, the fourth chapter. I want to talk to you about how to come out of these bad days. Galatians, the fourth chapter. On everybody having a bad day, say amen. Oh my goodness. I don't think you heard, I, I, I think you said amen automatically. Because you people say amen to everything. I could give my age and people say amen in this church. Verse 1, Galatians 4th chapter, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Now look at me, please. <clears throat> Under the Roman tradition, a child was placed in the hands of a tutor up to the years of uh, to eight years of age. The parents paid the tutor, and then from 8 to 25, they're in the hands of a governor, took care, especially especially the wealthy. Paul was talking about an adopt a, a, a father, wealthy man who's adopted a child. And he's taken this adopted child to school and placed in school under tutor. He's, th this tutor has one student and he tutors until he's eight years of age. At eight years of age, he turns him over to a financial guardian. And that guardian takes care of him until he's 25 years of age. And all this time, he's an heir to a fortune. But the Bible said... The heir, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Now, let's talk about this child becoming 25 years of age, coming to full, full age, a full age. The Apostle Paul, verse 6, uh, or, or, let's go down to verse 2 and 3. But is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now, look at me, please. Paul speaking, first of all, about the ministry of the law. He's saying, under the Old Testament, under the law, we were in school. The, the, the believers there were in school. They were being taught. But he said, there comes a time when the schooling ends, and you move in then to taking place as an heir, as a son. You're a servant right now because you are in school. You are a servant of the tutor. You're a servant of the governor. This, this boy, until he's 25 years old, couldn't touch his inheritance. He, he had no power to uh, control his life. He was told when to go and when to come, do this, do that. He was under the law. Now, that's what he's talking about first. But he's also talking about believers today, in this generation, us. He said, when you're a child, you're childish in your thinking when you're a child and you have not laid hold of your inheritance. He said, you're under bondage. You're under bondage by legalism, laws that you establish for yourself. Most of us as Christians believe that if, if we could just get the victory over this one or two things, most of us think we're about 98% holy. And we got this little 2% thing we got to deal with. And God, if I just get this 2% settled, if I can just make you enough promises or get my teeth, bite the bullet, if there's something I can do and get rid of this 2%, I'll be a saint. I will have made it. He said, you're still under bondage. You still don't see. That's... You're not a servant. You're not a slave anymore. You're Lord of all things. You own everything your father owns. Your father adopted you, loved you, and he put you to school to prepare you for something. He said, no, no, some people say, 
Well, our inheritance is eternal life. Folks, it goes beyond that. God sent the Holy Ghost to give us the earnest of it, the ability to tap into that wealth. Now, here on earth. Now, if you're going to tell me that this inheritance is gold and silver and material blessings, that's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. Because if God did that, he's planting covetousness in our heart, and he's leading us right to hell because that's what happened when he did it in the Old Testament. Jeshurun waxed fat and forgot God. That's not what it... Oh, God takes care of his children. Yes, he does. He's promised you'll never have to beg for food. He's going to take care of all of his children. But he says, if, if, you're, if you're going to stay in this childishness, can you imagine this, this son? It's time. The fullness of time came. That's when Jesus came and died on the cross. The fullness of time. The inheritance was made known. He got the notice. His governor, his tutor, everybody said, you're an heir now. Please understand that you graduate now. You go now and you don't need a governor to tell you how to spend money. You don't need your governor to tell you when and where to go. No one else is taking care of this. You're coming into maturity now. Go and claim your inheritance. And he doesn't believe it. Now, we're talking about a God who comes and comforts us when we have difficult times. Now, what, what good is it for this father to go to this 25-year-old boy now and say, son, everything's going to be all right, and he comforts him? That's not what... God is all about, not just to comfort you <laughs> when you're still a, in bondage. The Father is going to say, son, when are you going to take your place at my side? When are you coming into my house? When are you going to come and lay hold of the resources? Folks, 95% of God's people live far beneath their privileges. They're living beneath their privileges. I live be beneath mine. You live beneath your privileges. I don't think any of us have ever really laid hold of this promise. Verse 4, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem that which were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because we are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Verse 7, listen. Therefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then heir of God through Christ. Would you look at, look at the, at Galatians third chapter? Verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Look at me now. If you had faith in Christ Jesus, come on, raise your hand. I have faith. I am, a, I am a child of God. If you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, let me read it again, folks. It's in your Bible. It's not, I don't have a special edition. Verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. I go back down now to chapter 4. Chapter, verse 7. Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You're his child. You are no longer a servant. Now, you serve as a volunteer, but that is not your position now. That may be an occupation that you choose. But you are a son of the living God, and because you are a son, you are an heir of all that God placed in Jesus Christ. God gave all of his glory, all of his power, all of his resources, and put them in Jesus Christ, for in him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And he said, now you're an heir to everything that is in Christ Jesus. It all is yours. Folks, I'm seeing something clear and clear every day. That this world that you see around us is not the real world. This is an apparition. 
The real world is in the spirit. Folks, Jesus doesn't live on this earth. He's gone to the Father. He's seated at the right hand. He's a man in glory. He's God, but he's also a man. If he walked into this building and walked on this stage, you could see him. He would have a face. He would have ears and nose, mouth. He would look just like us. He's a man. And he's in glory at the right hand of the Father. And I want to tell you something. The real inheritance, the real thing that I want more than anything else is to be with him where he is. He has seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And our brother spoke it well this afternoon about the stuff that, that the things that the only thing that most of the bad days many of us have have to do with our stuff. We're afraid of losing stuff. We buy a house so it has a garage so we can store our stuff. You ever try to move? Stuff, stuff, stuff. Everywhere is stuff. And we're afraid of losing stuff. He said, set your affection on things above. The Holy Ghost comes down to draw us out of this world and bring us into our position, the spiritual position that he's put us with Christ in a heavenly place above the things of this world. Folks, when you begin to draw closer to Jesus, you're getting further and further away from the things of this world. You're getting away. There's no such thing in a man who had who is spiritually minded, who's moving out of this world. You know, I, I, I hear, I've heard preachers use a cliche mockingly. Oh, he's so... Heavenly minded, he's no spiritual good. I mean, he's so spiritually minded, he's no earthly good. You ever heard that? He's so spiritually minded, he's no earthly good. What a foolish statement. What absolute foolishness. The only way you're ever prepared to be living on this earth, God's way, is to be spiritually minded. There's no other way you can survive with the days that are coming. I, I was uh, yesterday in the, one of the newspapers. It said uh, <clears throat> lifeboat practice on Wall Street. They're, they're practicing what they call lifeboat uh, training now, how to bail out in the ugly crisis that's coming. The whole, the whole page, it's the most incredible thing I've, I've seen far beyond anything I've been prophesying and preaching. <clears throat> and I see all these things coming. But you know something? The more you obey what the Lord said, set your affection on things above, not on the things of the world, the less this news means to you. The less these reports mean to you. They have no meaning whatsoever after a while. They have no meaning. Folks, I was walking down a country road this past week and just praying, and and uh, that scripture came to me: life is just a vapor, just a vapor, and it's gone. And we're worrying about our bad days. What God wants you to do if you have a bad day, first of all. You're going to be convinced that he's a heavenly father. And you may stay, sit here the, today and say, brother, I just can't help it. I, I am not spiritually mature enough to deal with this. But my bad day has to do with the fact that I, I, I have a bad situation in my job that causes stress and I get sick. Yesterday's newspaper said 41% of all Americans now are sick daily because of stress on their jobs. Almost 50% are physically sick because of the stress on their job. Now, I want you to know, my God has all the resources. Now, these are spiritual resources, but he, he, they're all according to the riches of God in Christ Jesus. There's the riches of his wisdom we heard about. There's the, uh, the wisdom of his knowledge, the wisdom of his grace. And didn't he say, my God shall supply all your need according to the riches of God in Christ Jesus? That tells me that a loving Heavenly Father... I believe that God works with his children on the premise of affection. I, you cannot make it in these last days unless you know. You won't make it through your bad days unless you're absolutely convinced 
that he affectionately loves you. There's an affection in his heart. We've been hearing that all day. This keeps me more than anything else. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt he loves me. I am so convinced of that. I Literally, he when I'm in prayer, and, and he said, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. I just keep drawing near and worship and praise. I've literally felt his arms around me. You heard my son stand here. He said, you may laugh, but he said, I had Jesus kiss me on the cheek. <laughs> my, my son just loved Jesus all his heart. And he said, I'm just, I was loving on Jesus. And he, he said, Jesus, plan, I kiss. He said, it was a spiritual experience. But it was, it was just like embracing, getting so close to his heart. Folks, that's what it's going to take in these last days. But first of all, I'm telling you, be absolutely confident that he's affectionately loving you. He has a great affection in his heart. He's not mad at you. That he is concerned about all of these things. Now, in Greek, the word... <coughs> I, 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 I want to show this to you. My God shall supply all your need. This is Philippians 4.19. All your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I'm going to close in just a minute. That word there, need, means to handle all business, all that is lacking, all that's necessary. He didn't promise you to fulfill all your dreams. He didn't promise to fulfill all of your uh, wants. You know, I want this, I want that. Best thing God can do is knock all that out of us and purify our desires. And he said, I, he didn't even say needs. He said, I'm going to supply all your need. Singular, not plural. I'm going to supply all your need because it's one. It's single. It's Christ. It is Jesus. Because he alone satisfies. Bill Gates is the richest man in the world. So many billions, he can't count them now. Almost, almost literally. But every... Billionaire, if you just hold on long enough and listen, they'll talk to you about nothing they have bringing them any joy or any satisfaction whatsoever. There's no joy in it whatsoever. Howard Hughes, one of the billionaires who died, died with eight-inch fingernails, died with not a friend or eight people at his funeral, in his confession when he died, he said, nothing I've owned, nothing I've had, nothing I've possessed has ever given me a moment of joy, but made me miserable. He died in misery, died in pain. You say, Brother Wilson, what's that have to do with me? I, I, I'm stressed out. I have bills that I can't pay. And I wake up in the morning looking at the future. And I have this gloom hanging over me. I don't know what I'm going to do. Others of you say, I'm in a living condition that's hopeless. and It, it just burdened me down. I, I'm living in a marriage situation that's beyond hope. Let me read you a letter in closing. It may help you. This woman <coughs> said, Pastor David... In 1989, my husband lost a good job that was so important to him. He worked for the U.S. Army in Germany. He was fired by a commander who brought in his own people. It was a tragedy for my husband. He lost all self-esteem as well as his good income. He's never recovered. Even though he's employed, his salary is less than one half of what he's making. Now the responsibility is falling on me to be the primary breadwinner. A few weeks ago, I had a meeting one Friday night, but I had 45 minutes after work to lay down and rest. I was looking for something to read, and the Lord led me to a box of papers that I had kept. I pulled out one of your old sermons, a place called Wit's End, April 24, 1995. As I read it, the Holy Spirit ministered to me that that is exactly where I am. I'm at my wit's end. I'm going to be retiring from the service myself 
the worries keep piling on. We're drowning in financial difficulties. I can't get my husband's attention. It, it, he's like an ostrich that put his head in the sand and he just hoped the problems will go away. God showed me through your message that I've turned in anger against my husband. And I've been depending on him. I've been depending on the flesh. And I need to turn to Jesus alone as my only hope. As the only one who can provide for me and bring me out of these problems. I see now my husband can never bring me out. I read the message with assurance that God was with me at my wit's end. Later that evening I went to the meeting and one of the speakers at the meeting, who's a friend of mine, shared with her from her heart how God brought her out of a financial difficulty that she and her husband had gone through. She'd been obedient in sharing her embarrassing experiences. God meant it all for me. And afterwards, I shared with her about reading your message on Wits End, not knowing that she even knew of you, and how God used your message to talk and minister to me. The following week, I received a package from her. Inside was a copy of your message, Right Song, Wrong Side, dated May 11, 1990. How awesome. I called Karen. She told me she would send other messages. She said, Pastor David, I'm not through my trial yet. It's very hard. When I look down the road, I see potential disaster being hemmed in like the children of Israel. God has shown me that I have doubted his love for me. I've doubted his faithfulness to provide for me. I've also realized, as you've taught, that I've been good at suppressing my fear and that I've never dealt a death blow to my doubts. I've never dealt a death blow to my doubts. Now I want to put an end to my doubts. I'm going to choose to praise God for loving me, for his provisions, though I don't see them yet. Please pray for me. My prayer is that Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith, will heal my doubt, give me the gift of faith to trust him completely. I pray that he give me a song to sing on this side of the victory. I want so to pass this test. I want to sing the right song on the right side, a testimony of God's grace and to his faithfulness. Now we're getting so many letters like this from around the country from people whose faith is growing. They have seen God faithful, and they, they believe like I do, and many of us, that hard times are coming, but the Lord's going to see us through. And if this is your, if this is what you're going through, you're going to have to come to a place where say, Jesus, I have to cast all my care upon you now. You said that I'm an heir to the riches of God in Christ Jesus. And the riches of God in Christ Jesus include all my physical needs. I believe God for that. Will you stand? Folks, one last thing I want to say to you. I don't know what you're going through, but I do know what we're all going to go through. Some very powerful testing times. Little simple song we sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of the world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Hallelujah. Are you afraid? There's nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Hallelujah. Now, if you're going to take your place as an heir of God, whenever these things, you wake up in the morning, these things come at you, and the Spirit tries to fall on you and just lay inside and bring you down in your emotions, Tell yourself, Christ, my Savior, is my inheritance, and Him is fullness of joy, peace, wisdom, and grace, and all that I need. And if you just start cozying up to Jesus and start looking to Him, 
I find myself doing that every hour of the day anymore, all the waking hours. Saying, Lord, I don't want to be attached to anything on this earth now. Nothing. I don't want anything to take my attention away from you. Folks, you know that's possible on your job. That's possible on the way to work, on the way back. It's possible. Turn off the television. Turn everything off. Get alone with him. Start drawing closer and closer to the heart of Jesus. And you'll see the changes. And then you'll have the, your husband, your wife, you'll have others come up to you and say, what's happened to you? You have that look of peace. Brother Carter talked about how God had brought him into that peace. He has brought me into that peace. And God's no respecter of persons. He wants you to go through your day with peace no matter what you're going through and rest in the Holy Ghost so that those bad moments, they're only moments and you're dealing with them by the power of the Holy Spirit. You're dealing with them by saying, I am not a child under bondage anymore. I may not have the victory yet, but I hate my sin and God said the Holy Ghost in me will enable me and he's going to bring me through to victory and I'm not going to pout and put on a childish tantrum and I'm not going to accuse God of an unfaithfulness. Lord Jesus, I'm going to trust you. And the more you trust him, folks, there's only one way, and it's by faith. No other way. You cannot, you cannot approach anything of God. You cannot receive anything. You cannot reach any point of maturity in him other than faith. What else do you have to give him? The fruit of your lips and your faith. Heavenly Father, I pray this evening that you bring encouragement to our hearts, that we'll not be afraid, and that we will be able, we will have the tools, we'll have the ability to deal with these moments that come to us of discouragement and being downcast. And as David, we can say, I, he encouraged himself in the Lord. Help us, Lord, every time we get up in the morning now to encourage ourselves. God, you're going to see me through this day. God, you're going to see me through my financial difficulty. You're going to see me through this because you're my father. And no loving father would ever let his child down. You will not let me down because you love me. Glory be to God. Now I'm going to give an invitation for those that are going through not a difficult day or hard day. I'm not talking about the past 24 hours. I'm talking about a season you're going through. I don't care if it's been days or weeks. There's confusion. You you are not confident in God's will in your life. And little by little, you're being disturbed in your spirit. The total peace of Christ has not been yours lately. And you've been, your nest is being stirred. And I'm speaking in the spirit now very clearly to a number of you standing here right now. It's not that you're mad at God, you just wonder. You just wonder. Lord, I, just, I, I am confused. He wants to clear all that confusion before you walk out of this church tonight. If I've described you in any way, just get out of your seat and come and stand here. I'll pray with you and let's believe the Lord, but come in faith. Please don't come hoping God will deliver you. Come believing and trusting God will see you through this and deliver you tonight, right now in this church, in this service. Wherever you're at, all through, up in the balcony, go to the stairs on, on either side. Now, for you that have come forward, listen closely, please. When I, when I have a difficult time and I go to Jesus, and the first thing he tells me, that's what I believe he wants to tell you tonight. You have no reason to be afraid. None at all. You have no reason whatsoever to be afraid because I'm your God. I'm your Lord and I love you. And if God loves you, he truly loves you no matter what you're going through. He's saying, because of my love, because I am God, you have nothing to be afraid of. Nothing. And so I've always said, if God didn't give you the fear, why would you put up with it? You're not put up with it. If, if, if God didn't give it to you, 
You don't need to endure it. So, Lord, I give you these fears. I give you all my fear. Fear is a terrible, tormenting thing. You don't have to be afraid. Look at me now. Folks, get it in your mind now. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you've said. You're here now because you want him. And he's not mad at you. I want you to say this. God is not mad at me. My father loves me. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. You have nothing to be afraid of. Heavenly Father, I don't have enough words. I don't have words in my vocabulary to reach into the hearts of these people who have come sincerely to you. I don't have to beg you. I don't have to scream at you. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to come down now and do a work in the heart of everyone who has responded to you, not to me, not even to this invitation, but to your cry, to the call of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you now to change lives so that suddenly the light goes on. I am loved. He is my Father. I believe Jesus Christ is Lord. He is my Lord. I'm a child of God. I, I have inherited everything I need to live above fear, to live above the power of sin. God in Christ Jesus living in me has enabled me to have everything I need if I'll just trust that. If I will just believe it. Now, Holy Spirit, make that simplicity known and experienced in the hearts of everybody who came now. I ask you to take the darkness, Lord, smite the darkness and let the light of the gospel let the light of the love of Jesus come in. You loved us so much, you gave your own son. You said, you're a loving father. You have affection. Put your arms around these women that hurt. Put your arms around the men that are coming right now. Lord, embrace them and say, you are loved, deeply loved. Now confess your sins and believe on me. And trust me now that I will take you through every battle and every trial. I want everybody to come forward and pray this with me. Jesus, I acknowledge you. As my Lord and Savior, I receive by faith the cleansing and forgiveness of all my sins. I open my heart now and ask you, Jesus, to take my doubts and all my fears, my guilt, my condemnation. Remove it from my life. Oh, Jesus, embrace me with your love. Father, help me to know and to understand and never forget that you love me. I love you for that, Lord. And I thank you for it. And I give you my praise. Now just tell them thanks in your own way. Just say, thank you, Jesus. I give you thanks. I praise you. I return now to give you thanks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remember the story I told you that wife who endured a husband who cheated on her all her life, a preacher, and yet the Lord took her through? The same God who took her through is going to take you through. The same God who's seen me through all these years is going to take you through. The same God that's seen my wife through 25 operations, six for cancer, is going to see you through. He's no respecter of person. He's going to see you through. Hallelujah. I, I want you to turn around, shake hands with five or six, and say, God's going to see me through. or God's going to see you through. God's going to take care of things. Whatever God tells you, God's going to take care of it. God's going to take care of it. This is the conclusion of the message.